Today's episode of the Outer Roll podcast is brought to you by Goalie Monkey. Next time you need any goalie equipment, head to goaliemonkey.com, plug in promo code PODCAST10, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, the number 10, one zero, for 10% off your entire order. That's PODCAST10 at goaliemonkey.com. Some exclusions may apply. Go check it out. Get yourself a nice little 10% discount and stay tuned for the Outer Roll podcast. sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Welcome back, boys and girls, to the Outer Roll Podcast. Very happy to be back here. Brought to you by Goalie Monkey on the Monkey Sports Podcast. If you've been following the last couple of weeks, you'll know that we took a month off or so trying to get everything figured out, obviously, with all this craziness going on, but we are very excited to be back. We have a fantastic episode with you today. Alex Cavallini, formerly Alex Rigsby, Team USA gold medalist, Olympic gold medalist, five-time world champion, incredibly decorated goalie, gave us a fantastic interview. Definitely stay tuned for that. We talk about everything from the crazy... World Championship game in Finland, her time with the Olympics, her time growing up in Wisconsin and not Chicago. Everything you need to know about Alex Cavallini, Alex Rigsby. Fantastic interview. We'll hop right into it, but over the last month or so, last couple weeks, there's been a couple new developments in the goalie world. A couple things have been released, a couple changes going on. Despite everything that's been happening around the world, Grayson, what have we missed over the past few weeks? Uh, I'm just happy to be back, first off. I hope everyone's doing well. And uh, just some quick updates to things that have come onto the website. Uh, everyone knows who's been a goalie for a long time or even just a short time that this is gear, this is prime gear season. Everything's coming out. So just for a starter, the quick one is Bauer. They have the ultrasonic customizer available now. So all the time that you guys are spending at home, just hop on that. Send, send us some designs on Instagram. Let us know what you're coming up with. And then on to CCM, they also have their customizers available today, actually. It's going to be the first that they're available on our website. And that one's a lot, a lot of fun to mess around with. Tons of different things you can do with the Axis pad. And then also on our website, we have the pads, gloves, blocker, and pants all available stock that you can order right now. And then on to Warrior, who we actually talked with Kirk Allen last month, or in March, actually, it's been a while, um, talked to him uh, about the new gear. So if you wanted any information and, you know, get a little informed before you make a purchase, if you did want to purchase it or you want to order a custom set, go listen to that. It's from Kirk Allen, episode three. And uh, available right now is the pads, glove, and blocker. And also the M1 sticks are going to be available now. The F1 helmet and G5 chest protectors are on pre-order, and the customizers are available for the M1 Pro, M1 Pro Plus sticks, and also all of the G5 gear. Well, there you go. Be sure to check it all out, goaliemonkey.com. As we said at the top of the podcast, be sure to use promo code PODCAST10 for 10% off your entire order. Go check those out. Without further ado, Alex Cavallini, Alex Rigsby. Welcome back to the Outer World Podcast. This week, our guest is Alex Rigsby Cavallini, five-time world champion, CWHL champion, NCAA champion, and Olympic gold medalist. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me on. My first question right out of the gate when Grayson was naming off all of those champions, has the Olympic gold medalist term set in yet? I know it's been a couple years, but does it still feel (laughs) surreal? Yeah, it is pretty wild. I mean, you know, I feel like I felt a lot more of the emotion too just recently with the whole Olympic Games getting postponed for the Summer Olympics. You know, you just feel for those athletes who've been training so hard for this moment and um, to all of a sudden have to wait a whole another year. It's, it's pretty tough, you know, when you're you're been training so hard for such an incredible moment. And, you know, it is, it is pretty amazing. It's fun getting back together whenever we can with, you know, the group that, uh, you know, won the gold together and... Yeah, it's it's a pretty amazing group to be a part of. Yeah, I bet it's uh it's kind of weird for people to be training for the Olympics and then all of a sudden you have one more year to go. You know, maybe they were peaking out and they 
felt like this this is their best time and now they have to wait another year. And I, I'm not sure how it works with like requalifying for certain events, especially in Summer Olympics. But uh, I, I've only heard like little bits here and there. Yeah, same. I mean, I heard just a little bit about it where they were saying that the people who had already qualified would stay qualified. But it's going to be so interesting to see for people who didn't have their trials yet. I mean, gymnastics and track, none of them had a trials yet. So then to see who could come up, I mean, you think about the age people who weren't even of age at the time might be of age next year. And I think that's a really big deal for sports like gymnastics, but it'll be really interesting. And, um, you know, I wish all those athletes luck and, um, you know, hopefully they're, they're keeping it together in this crazy time. Yeah, no, certainly. How's uh, how's your quarantine coming? How's your training going and everything through all this? I honestly, we have a great setup. Um, we actually, so my husband and I live in New York city and we left, um, we're going on eight weeks now. And we drove home just because we're like, you know, he's working from home the next week. It'll be a great opportunity to see family. And my worlds had just, our world championships had just gotten canceled. So I'm like, I'm not training. So let's go see family. And so we drove to his parents thinking we'd see his parents for a few days and then head up to my parents. And, uh, eight weeks later, we're still <laughs> at his parents and so yeah. living with the in-laws, but we have a great gym set up. And, um, I mean, that's pretty much my one task of the day is to make sure that I get my lift in and, uh, making sure that I've been staying healthy and, you know, treating my body well through this whole quarantine. Yeah. I've been seeing you guys, uh, pulled out the blades and we're ripping around the streets. Oh yeah. We had a blast. Um, I mean, it's, it's a big hockey family and, you know, we played street, we played street hockey the past couple weekends and it's been a blast just being able to get outside and get some competitiveness going and yeah. compete out there. How's your street hockey game comparable to uh, well, ice? It's pretty terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty atrocious. I mean, I definitely go for the defense and, uh, you know, try to block the shots, but the offensive game is not there at all. Yeah, so your husband played uh, for Wisconsin as well, correct? Yeah, so yeah, he played at Wisconsin. Um, he was a 21-year-old freshman, so he was a freshman my senior year, so that was pretty wild. I mean, we had already been dating, and then he had committed to Wisconsin, so it just worked out really well. But it was really fun to be able to support him post my Wisconsin career and be able to go to all of his home games. And um, So we had been living in Madison up until – this past September when we moved to New York City for his job. But, um, you know, it's really fun being able to have him, you know, understand the game and be able to lean on him for support. And I'm kind of bummed now that he has a big boy job because I can't drag him out to all <laughs> yeah. my goalie lessons. But when he was still in school and grad school, I'd make him come out and shoot on me. And uh, it's always really fun when we can get on the ice together. Yeah, I bet that that's a, it's a great tool to have. Then you can just pull out someone who's an NCAA shooter out on you at really any point, but not so much anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he can rip it. Like, I would never <laughs> tell him that, but he can actually <laughs> rifle a shot. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> just we'll, don't hit me in the head, please. <laughs> we'll make sure he doesn't listen to this episode then, so you, you, you can keep that one in your bag. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So what, no, it's it's always really fun. Yeah, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but just talking about Wisconsin. So we had Sarah Nurse on a couple of weeks ago, and she talked about just how awesome it was playing in Madison. What was that experience like for you, getting to be a Badger and, and playing four years up there? It was absolutely incredible. You know, it was honestly one of the best experiences of my life. Um, you know, the friendships that you come out of. Uh, you know, we won a championship, and you're treated like a pro there, and. You know, it's they set the center standards high, and it's really amazing to be a part of with the coaching staff and the players that come through. I mean, we got players like I play with Sarah Nurse, and you know she's an Olympian, and there's a whole you know list of Olympians that have come through the program, and that it just speaks so much for them. And um, you know, I was so happy for them recently to win the national championship, and I was bummed that their their season came to an end. Uh, pretty abruptly this year but you know it was it was amazing to be a part of and like I said my my best friends are are from Wisconsin and um, really wouldn't change anything something that we're going to get to a little bit later the NHL all-star game so many of those players both goalies were from Wisconsin and there was uh, quite a few players 
Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, you're looking at this ro- the rosters, and we're like, oh my gosh, we could have a team with just Badgers here. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. It was like a Badgers um, alumni yeah, game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the Badger fans I know loved it and totally ate that up, but you know, it was cool having Anne Renee be the other goalie. I mean, obviously, we played together at Wisconsin. She was a freshman my senior year, and she's an incredible goaltender, and you know, last, two seasons ago, I was able to train with her. She kind of was coming out of retirement she kind of took I wouldn't say retirement but she took a year off after the Olympics and started skating up again in that spring and then we skated through the summer together and you know it was really fun to be able to get back on the ice with her and um, although we're competing against each other it's still fun to to learn from one another and push each other yeah I I I think it's really helpful to have a goalie of that caliber also be alongside you because you guys are always competing with each other she's the one generation below you and also a high competitor being on team Canada. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we were joking too. We we're like, all right, who's going to whip out the most pad sacks here? I was like, it's <laughs> definitely not going to be me. It's definitely going to be Anne. I mean, she's, she's got that flashy style to her, which is awesome. And, uh, she can, you know, definitely get the fans going. And we were joking about, so we're like, who you're for sure going to be doing, you have to whip out at least one pad stack, but I don't think it came out, but, um, just that whole game. I mean, we were so lucky to have the support of the NHL and for them to bring us all in and, um, treat us the way they did it was just an incredible opportunity to grow the game of women's hockey and I think you know the fans really enjoyed it and it was really cool to be able to get you know fans outside of women's hockey um, who you know are strictly NHL fans and to, for them to be able to see our side of the game and I think it was it was very entertaining for them and um, you know we had a blast doing so. So going off of that, and obviously, you know, we had a, a similar conversation with Sarah when we had her on, but the PWHPA and kind of the work that uh, that they've been doing or you guys have been doing I guess to grow women's hockey where do you see that continuing to grow in the future and and continuing to help out uh, the sport especially for the women's game yeah I mean you know we created that PWHPA last year and so the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association and basically gathered up um, about 200 players who you know stood together and said that we're gonna not play in a women's hockey league until we believe it's the right league and sustainable and going to be able to provide opportunities for the future um you know future players of the game and uh the future generations and you know we don't see that right now that there's any leagues that are sustainable and um so we've come together and last year we was the first year and we had a dream gap tour where we went to different nhl areas and so different places throughout canada and the u.s and had the support of these nhl teams that you know, put on a showcase for us. And I think we gained a lot of momentum from that last year. And it, it was awesome that we had, you know, I think there was one player who wasn't a part of the P-Dub in All-Star Weekend. And that person was a person in, who played in China. And so I think, um, you know, it says a lot about the players that are part of this association. And um, I think we're going to grow a lot from it this past season and continue the momentum moving forward. I, I remember watching the game uh, with the Calgary Inferno when you guys won it. Basically, going from like that excitement and then transitioning, you know, like a few months later to the whole league collapsing and then the formation of this uh, organization. It was yeah, it was it was disappointing. I mean, to say the least. And you know, that league in no way was you know, obviously sustainable, which is exactly why they folded it and made that decision to do so. But you know, from my experience that year, I absolutely loved it. I was commuting back and forth from Calgary and, and Madison, and I was doing that because, you know, I couldn't uproot myself, you know, move away from my fiancé to go play for a women's team, who which I was making $2,000 Canadian for the whole year. So, you know, it's things like that where I don't think people really understand what we kind of have to sacrifice, and we're doing this because we love the sport. And, you know, I had an amazing experience with the Calgary Inferno, and, gained so many friendships from that team as well. I mean, it was made up of mostly the Canadians and had a couple of U.S. teammates on it. And I thought the caliber of play was awesome. I mean, that final game against Montreal was so exciting. And we had an awesome crowd at the, I think it was the Marley's, yeah, it was the Marley's yeah. Arena in, in Toronto. And it was, you know, so fun having my family there and having so much support from the women's game. Um, and then, you know, we're together at a world for our world championships, about to leave for Finland. And that was a couple of weeks after we had just won and we got the news that the league was folding and that was absolutely crushing. You know, all of a sudden we were 
having all these players who are like, okay, well, what are we doing next year? And that's when we quickly decided that, you know, we needed to take a stand for ourselves and we couldn't be, you know, we couldn't just keep going through the ringer for these leagues that weren't, you know, adequate and providing us the resources that we deserved. So, yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, that you guys were obviously out at the world championships in Finland when all this stuff was going on, which we'll get into all of that here in, in a little bit. Cause that's, you know, an incredible story too, but how tough was it to kind of have that in the back of your mind while you were trying to compete for a world championship that, you know, you'd come back home and then there was so much uncertainty? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, uh, so we were in Long Island and it was the morning. So it was the morning that we were leaving town. And so we were we had a call. So it's like, okay, see up call. So a bunch of us were on it. And then we had practice. We were leaving for the rink in an hour and all of a sudden this news broke and, you know, try not to have, you know, panic across all of us because we knew that we had to focus on the task at hand. That was the world championships. You know, that's what we've been training for all year. And for us, we, we knew we needed to kind of put that on the back burner, but we also needed to make sure that we were making the right moves at the right time. Um, so we got kind of the, spoke to the Canadians right away. They had already landed in Finland. And so it was just kind of crazy timing. And um, there were some discussions while we were at the world championships and, then when we came home, that's when we really kicked it in the high gear and um, started getting, you know, kind of gathering up our thoughts and trying to figure out what the next year would look like. I can only imagine kind of sitting there ha- hearing that news and then having to just refocus up as a, as a group collectively because, you know, one thing happens to the one league, it's collective as an entire uh, like organization. You guys got to band together in that type of thing. Yeah, and that's what it kind of felt like too. I mean, we had... You know, most of the girls or most of the women on our team, um, they were part of the NWHL, but, you know, they felt that. They felt it and were like, it kind of made us realize that, you know, one, we knew that we couldn't have two leagues. And then two, we knew that neither league was the right league that was going to help us, you know, be at our best. And, you know, we work so hard day in, day out to be the best. And uh, we want to compete with the best and we want to be treated like the best. And, um, we're, we're just working hard towards, you know, making, reaching that goal. So I just wanted to circle back to your early years. What were some inspirations? Kind of like, how did you get started with goaltending? I grew up in Wisconsin, grew up outside of Milwaukee and started, I got into goaltending pretty quickly. I mean, we did the whole rotation of gear and I fell in love with it right away. And from that point forward, that was like my main sport. I continue to play a lot of different sports and, but then it came time in fifth grade, I played AAA hockey, and the coach of my team that year and the next year was actually my now father-in-law. So he kind of got me on the team. I was playing boys AAA hockey, and I was playing at the 91 birth year. So I did that for three years, and then I ended up in Chicago, and that's where my Chicago ties are. I played for the Chicago Mission boys 92 team in eighth and ninth grade. So that's when I was driving down. I would drive down for practices three times a week and then the games on the weekend and I was driving back and forth with a couple of teammates and so our parents would rotate on who was driving that week just so they weren't having to drive every night and it was an incredible experience honestly um, our team was amazing we had so many incredible players on it who you know are continuing to play hockey today and um, or you know coaching and giving back and I think it's really cool it was really cool just to be a part of that and you know, they set such high standards at the Chicago Mission, and it's been really cool to see them, you know, grow into the program that they are today and now practicing out of fifth third where the Blackhawks train. And so, yeah, it's been really fun to just be able to stay connected in the Chicago area and, you know, continue to kind of, you know, be a part of the Chicago community in hockey. I think a lot of people think are really surprised when they hear I'm from Wisconsin just because I do so many things in Chicago. Yeah. And so I've joked so many times where I'm like, why am I not? Why am I living in Wisconsin? Why am I not living in Chicago right now? I'm driving back and forth so much. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I uh, I read somewhere that you uh, played with Brianna Decker and Kendall Coyne Schofield uh, at some point growing up, and now they're both on your PWHPA team. Yeah, and the national team, and um, you know, so Bree and I we grew up in the same organization in Wisconsin, the youth organization, and I. L- People were like, oh, you can keep playing boys hockey. There's a girl older than you, and she's really good, and she's holding holding her own. And So that was Bree. And then I came down to Chicago, and 
And so Bree and I actually ended up playing AAA hockey together. My second year of AAA, she came, we convinced her to come over. I mean, she was so good. She would, she yeah. would take on any guy in the quarter. I mean, she would just bulldoze through them. And so, yeah. um, you know, she's, she's a tough one and it was really fun to be able to play with her and, you know, continue to play with her and, you know, we play Wisconsin together and Calgary Inferno and the national team. And so it's been a really cool journey, hockey journey with alongside her and Kendall known her since I was like 11 or 12 because we played on a part-time girls team together. And so she actually skated. She just practiced with our team, the mission boys. So in eighth and ninth grade, she would come and she would practice with us. And that was really cool um, to have her be a part of the team and same thing I mean she's obviously an incredible hockey player and so she was still playing girls for games and stuff like that but um yes I've known these people these girls for a long time it's just really cool to continue to have our hockey pads together speaking of Chicago and kind of playing boys you were drafted by the steel correct I was yeah I was drafted when I was in high school was there ever a thought of kind of continuing to follow that path and you know forge a path for maybe women getting into the NHL and things like that uh, yeah, I mean, I tried out for them, and it was an awesome experience. Uh, they treated me so well. Um, it was funny. I will never forget going to the rink and carrying my hockey bag, and, you know, I was trying to figure out where to go, and there's a ton of people, and someone asked, like, oh, what are you here for? I was like, oh, I'm here for the trial. So like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm trying out for the team. Like, I was drafted. <laughs> and the looks on the guys' faces were just priceless. And, you know, it was, it was awesome. It was an awesome experience. And, you know, I, I totally held my own, and I was really proud with how I competed and, and played and made it into the top three. Uh, so I made it to the final game and didn't make the team, but it was still really cool to be a part of. And, um, I think what's cool is that I still compete with boys and, you know, I skate with the guys a lot of, you know, especially at summers, Wisconsin, I would skate with the pros who come back. And, you know, I think that's, what's cool too about these guys is that they have so much respect for us women who play the game and, um, they see how hard we work and, you know, they work their butts off and we work our butts off and, uh, it just creates that respect and, um, you know, we've all had to earn it, but, it's really cool to see that these guys continue to support us. Speaking of the people that you trained with, you trained with Brian Elliott, correct? Yeah, so he would always he comes back to Wisconsin in the summers, and there was one summer summer we skated together quite a bit. Um, last year, he was kind of battling with some injuries from the previous season that he was just trying to recover from, so we didn't get to skate together, which I was kind of bummed about. But yeah. he's an awesome guy. You know, he works so hard in the weight room and making sure he's doing the little things right, which, you know, speaks to his career, his long career, and guys like that that, you know, are really fun to be around and really cool to just kind of see their habits and what they do to prepare for practices and training. I wanted to uh, go a little bit forward on that to uh, 2014. So you had you were an NCAA champion at the time. You were a world champion, and then you didn't make the Olympic roster. How did that affect your following years leading up to 2018? It was tough. I mean, that was one of the, you know, toughest things in my hockey career, especially at that time. You know, I'd been a part of the team for the full year and went to tryouts and there's only four goalies at the tryouts and three were going to make it. And I thought I had an incredible tryout and was really proud about how I, how I played and left it all on the table and kind of went in with the mentality where it's like, I'm not going to give these coaches any opportunity or any, any idea on how to cut me. And so yeah. I didn't make the team, but it was heartbreaking at the time. And it really was hard to get back on the ice after that. Um, but I was so lucky to have the support of my family and my now husband at the time. And, yeah. uh, you know, my teammates at Wisconsin, I was so lucky to have them. They picked me up and um, got me excited for the season. And, I honestly had the best year. Like, it was so much fun. We didn't win a national championship that year. We were so close. But it was just so much fun being a part of the team. And for the first time, I wasn't, you know, thinking national team, national national team. And, um, you know, had that balance in my life. And I think that's really opened my eyes to, you know, having that balance. You never know when you could be playing your last game or having your last practice. And kind of having that idea where it's like, you know what, I'm going to go out there and have fun. I'm going to enjoy it don't know how long this is going to last and i'm really lucky to continue to have to continue to play for the next six years after that and you know after that year 
I had to really sit down and think like, okay, am I, is this it? Like, am I going to keep playing or am I going to, you know, move on, you know, give up my dream of playing in the Olympics. And I decided then that I was not ready to give up and I had a lot left in me and I was going to do whatever I could to make that next team and ended up making it. And that was quite the journey as well. I faced a lot of adversity through those times, but I think, you know, me looking back on it, I'm 28 years old now and still playing the game I love and, I've learned so much through it, and you know, I think I've grown and matured a lot as a person through my time on the national team. So we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but going back to obviously, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> we're all over the place. Yeah, exactly. We had a lot written down. So going back to kind of the you know people you've trained with and people you've played with, and obviously having this huge support system through everything throughout your entire hockey career. Is there any player or goalie or someone that you kind of? Uh, model your game after or your mindset or anything like that or are you more kind of doing things yourself um I feel like it's kind of hard honestly um as a female goaltender I mean I get asked this question a lot and it's hard to to kind of look at an NHL goalie and be like I play after that person that's always hard just because you know they're six two six four I was gonna, I was gonna say yeah six eight like <laughs> come on I'm five seven over here can't be going down on a butterfly twenty four seven so it's not Ben Bishop that you model your game no I cannot I cannot <laughs> not block like five. Cameron Crawford or whatever and I don't know someone I like watching is Vasilevsky but just because he's so quick in his movements and um, very precise and I really like watching him but. Someone for the mindset side um, who really changed my career was, I have to say, Jesse Vetter. I mean, she's an absolute legend in, yeah. at Wisconsin and on the national team, and I was so lucky. Um, you know, I said after I was done in 2014 from Wisconsin, I had to make the decision on if I was going to continue to play hockey. And that year I was finishing up school and was doing goalie lessons, and I got with my goalie coach for the first time, Larry Clemens, and he trains he was training Jesse Vetter and so he's like yeah come on out skate with us and so I started skating with them and it was honestly like life-changing I mean just to be with her and be able to to watch her and see you know her practice habits and she was always having so much fun yeah that was just like eye-opening to me I was you know I was a person who I was like go 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 like don't stop like I'm gonna get a domino outwork everyone like that kind of mentality and you know, she was, she was about my age at the time and, you know, she had that balance and she'd figured it out and she was having fun. And for me, it was really my eye opening just because I'm like, I can't keep pushing my body and, you know, throwing it through the ringer, like what I'm doing, it's not going to help my career in the long run. And, you know, I still work my butt off, but I work smart. And I think that's been the biggest change for me is, you know, having that balance, you know, enjoying the whole wedding process, enjoying getting married, enjoying, you know, moving yeah. to a different city, but also still, you know, competing and, and playing hockey. Yeah, I can absolutely attest to that. So when when I met you in 2015, I remember at the camp that we were at, I remember going into the uh, weight room for like a little bit of extra time. <laughs> and like in the morning, you were there. In between lunch, you were there. And then even when I would leave, you were still there. And I remember how like inspiring that was to me you know, like trying to become like a good goalie at the time, just seeing someone of your caliber with, with like your achievements, like that, that's what it takes, you know, like seeing all yeah. the, the behind the scenes stuff, like all, all that people see is like what comes out on the ice. They don't see the hours and hours put in on the weight room. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I mean, I still don't get me wrong. I'm still, you know, trained pro I'm right now I'm training six or seven days a week and making sure I'm active on that seventh day, but I think I'm just working smarter now. I mean, I listen to my body. If it's super sore and whatever, I'm going to be like, okay, today's a recovery day. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just, you know, making sure that I'm not, you know, hurting my hips. I've had two hip surgeries and for years I'm like, I'm just in constant pain and wasn't getting that figured out and was able to figure that out with different exercises and rehab. And, you know, so I focus a lot of, on that now and, making sure that I have a good warm-up routine before. I mean, I'm sure you guys can say the same thing. You could go to the rink, you know, do a few stretches here and there, and then jump on the ice and feel great. Now it's to the point where my body's like, you didn't warm up, you're going to feel like crap this whole time. You know, yeah. you, you got to put in that time. I'm showing up, you know, an hour before I skate and getting a good 30-minute warm-up in and making sure that my body's feeling good so it's ready to go on the ice and, you know, make sure that I'm prepared and ready to go so I'm, I'm feeling good. I mean, it's... It's different now without especially having a league where 
um, your, your, you know, college team where you go on the ice, you know, you're on the ice six, seven days a week and, you know, you're skating a ton and you got your practices planned out for me now. It's, you know, I take every opportunity to get on the ice that I can. I'm not taking any of it for granted because, you know, it's hard. It's hard scheduling your own practices and, you know, skating with one-on-one with the goalie coach and making sure that you're focused for that entire hour because you're not going to get more. Um, you not you don't have the luxury of being like, oh, I can take two and a half hours or two hours on the ice. No, I'm on an hour slot and that's it. So I got to make sure that I'm not having to waste time when I get on the ice to try, try to make my body feel good. I have to be feeling good before I step on the ice. Yeah, absolutely. And then so uh, between 14 and 2018 Olympics, you won three world championships and then made the Olympic roster. Do you think the kind of like the process for that was helpful for you to win all those championships. So just kind of like speak on the Olympic process and how you were selected for that 2018 team. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty crazy. I mean, we were in the locker room and um, I remember the big talk going into the Olympics was, you know, our team was a winning team. Majority of our team had never lost, which is wild to think about. I mean, we had our veterans who had lost in the 2014 Olympics. I was the only one, on the 2013 World Championship, that team that was still playing that didn't make the 2014. So there had been some players who had lost at the Olympics, and then there was a lot of the new players who were part of the player pool starting in the 2014-2015 season that had never lost. So we had talked about that a lot. I mean, you know, we never took it for granted that we were a winning team, and, you know, we were so – we were such a close knit group and we were such a strong group and we really relied on our veterans to kind of share those emotions and share kind of their past experiences. I mean, we had a lot of two time Olympians who had lost in the final game and won silver. And so for us, we were able to learn off of that, like learn from them. And we knew that we didn't want to go through that again. And we didn't want to go through that for them. We wanted to win for them. And so I think that was really cool. But what was crazy leading up to the Olympics is we had lost so many games to Canada. Um, yeah. We even lost in, in the game or in the round robin in the Olympics. And so we finally came out with a victory in that final game and in, in the shootout. And so for us, I mean, we knew that we could pull it out. We knew that we could win. We knew we believed in each other. And I think that's what was so special about our group is that, um, you know, everything that we had gone through that year, it, we had been through so much adversity together and we knew that, we had the team that this team was going to be the team that won. So apart from obviously all the success you had on the ice at the Olympics, what was kind of the coolest part of just being there and in the entire experience? I think one of the coolest things that stood out the most was one walking in the the opening ceremonies. Um, Our team got there and we were kind of in the middle of the pack. And as you're getting up, lined up for the opening ceremonies, you don't see it like on TV we're in like a pit, like kind of felt like cattle where you're going through these zigzag lines. Everyone's in order. You have your teams like this is where USA is. This is where Canada is and blah, blah, blah. And um, so we're going through this and our team was trying to stay together as much as you can. And all of a sudden we're kind of making turns. We're getting closer. You can hear the stadium and we make the final turn to go onto the stadium. And there was like six of us from our team all of a sudden in the front of the line for the yeah. opening ceremonies. And that was the coolest thing ever. We were right up there with Aaron Hamlin, who was the, the flag bearer. And, you know, we walk into Gangnam style and um, <laughs> in the, the opening ceremonies. And that was so incredible to be alongside, you know, Team USA, your own Team USA teammates for hockey. And um, that was just a really, really cool experience. And my parents were there and my brother. And um, so for them to be able to see that, I mean, that's like a dream come true, right? You see that as a kid growing up and be like, I want I want to do that. I want to walk in with Team USA and represent the United States of America. And so for that, that was really cool. And throughout the rest of the time, it was just really fun being able to go to different events and support our teammates, our Team USA teammates, as much as we could. And there's just so much pride in, in everything that everyone did and everyone is rooting for each other. And so that was really fun to be a part of. Yeah, I remember uh, when we interviewed Nicole Hensley, she was talking about the same thing, just kind of walking in, how surreal that really feels about like dreaming as a, as a kid and kind of making it all reality. Yeah. We were in the front of the line together. It was her, Maddie and I. So we're like, how did the three (laughs) goalies get in the front of the line? (laughs) Yeah. It was 
awesome. So yeah, it was it was really cool. We were joking about that the other day too. We we're like, how do we do that? How do we get there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, still don't know. Yeah. So obviously you're you know incredibly decorated throughout your entire hockey career. I imagine the Olympic gold has to be kind of that peak there. But of everything throughout your entire career, what's kind of one or two memories that really stick out for you? Um, yeah, obviously that's up there. I mean, that's something that you've dreamt about your whole life. And one thing that just really comes to mind is me, it, for me is, um, you know, just even winning the world championships last year in Finland, that was an incredible moment. And, um, I mean, I've never played it in a game as rowdy as that was. <laughs> never. It was it was absolutely insane. I mean, it, it was the first time that Finland had ever made it to a world championship final game. And they're in Finland. The fans there were crazy. Like, imagine a soccer game where everyone's screaming the entire time. You couldn't hear anything. It was so much fun. And the thing that was crazy was when that goal called back and mm-hmm. got called back in yeah. overtime. And it took 10 minutes to review. And then for us to finally win and, you know, that was just a really cool cool game and it was fun to be a part of and for me what's so special about that was just um you know being able to come back and get that starting position and held on to that for the past couple years and you know to be able to come back and you know work my way into that spot was just really cool for me for myself but overall team that was just an awesome awesome win so i'm glad you brought it up because you knew obviously we had to get there of just the (laughs) the craziness of that entire game yeah so you know, obviously the goal gets called back. You knew quickly that, you know, obviously you were interfered yeah, with after the shot and everything. You were, yeah. you know, immediately turning to the official and everything. But in that time between when they're reviewing the goal and, you know, what potentially could happen if going into a shootout and stuff, how, like, what was the conversation going on? How was it to stay focused into like, okay, if this is over, what do we do? Or if we keep playing, like what happens? Like it, obviously you have to then kind of turn it back on, it seems, or what, yeah. what did that, how did that kind of break down for you? I get pretty fired up, um, <laughs> and it's about, for me, controlling that. I wouldn't say I'm an emotional goalie in any way. You know, I keep my composure, kind of ignore things. But for that instance, I was fired up because I knew that I had been interfered with. The puck was about to drop in my glove. I was in the crease. I got absolutely destroyed from the side. <laughs> no player pushed her in, like, completely sideswiped right in the head, right? So I knew immediately that I was interfered with. There should be no goal. And so I go to the bench, I'm screaming, I'm like, there's no way that's a goal. The coaches are like, what happened? We didn't see it. Tell us everything. (laughs) You know, I'm telling them, I'm going off. All my teammates are just kind of chilling on the bench, like not knowing what to think, not knowing how to act. I'm going up and down the bench screaming like, we got this. This isn't going to be a goal. We're going to come back. We're going to win this game. We're going to bury them. We're Like, this is it. Like, we're going to win this game. Like, we're going to come back. So... 10 minutes later, the call gets, you know, caught, like, no goal. So we're obviously cheering, and all of a sudden, they say that we get a penalty. And so we're like, who got the penalty? Like, there was no tripping. Like, there's no interference going to the net. Like, they're showing, like, we had seen the replay. Like, who got the penalty? You got the penalty, right? Yeah, I got the penalty. <laughs> I go to the ref. I go, why are we on a five? Why is it a five on four? Like, why or whatever it was, a four on three. I was like, why did we get a penalty? And she's like, you got the penalty. And I was like, for what? She's like, for tripping. <laughs> so they said I got the tripping penalty when I was trying to make the save and the the person interfered with me. So I was like, oh, my gosh. So for me in that instance, I was like, there is not a chance they're scoring on this power play. Yeah. So for me, it just gave me so much motivation. And, um, you know, you have to get your, you know, kind of get your breathing back in, get dialed in, be focused and, um, you know, put all those emotions to the side. And, you know, we ended up holding them off on that power play and taking them into a shootout. Yeah, that's one of the most incredible games I've, I've ever been <laughs> able to watch. I remember turning it on and that 10 minutes feels like an hour when you're waiting oh. for for a call, the yes or no. And like, I, can, I can't only imagine how heartbreaking it is for the other team. Like, you think like you just won it the first time you ever made it to the gold and then just kind of gets turned back. It's like, it's unfortunate, but like, it's an incredible story to tell. I mean, that's what was crazy about the whole thing was that they had, they were straight up celebrating. I mean, they had gloves, helmets, sticks, everything was all over the ice. Yeah. I mean, they full on celebrated and, you know, we're taking pictures and whatnot. And we're like, I was like, there's not a chance. Like, it's not even, it wasn't even like a fair goal. You know what I mean? Like, 
it was in my mind it was cheap and you know obviously very happy that how it turned out for us <laughs> and you know the fans were pretty upset that they ended up losing but still I mean it was an incredible game and props to Finland for coming out and you know bringing that game to us so with all you know with all your accomplishments obviously that being your fifth world championship what's uh what's kind of next what's next on like your your hockey bucket list you've obviously climbed all these mountains and had all this incredible success like what are you uh what are you trying to go for next really you know obviously going for another olympics and you know that's in the back of my mind every day it's coming up so fast with tryouts and they're going to be next season and it's hard when you know everything's kind of the world's kind of up in the air right now but for me I want to earn that starting position and keep it and um you know have that going into the olympics and you know obviously want our team to come out with another gold medal I'd say too in general like I want to be able to see out you know my career's you know I'm getting up there in age and you know I don't think in any way that I'm I'm peaking or you know my time's coming anytime soon as long as I'm healthy but you know, I would love to see out a women's hockey league and would love to be a part of that and be a part of the generation that, that changes it for the next generation. I mean, that's this is the group that's going to do it, and I feel so fortunate to be a part of it and be a part of, you know, alongside such strong women who, you know, are my best friends and role models and, you know, mentors. And so I, I'm hoping that we can all be able to see this out sooner than later. I wanted to leave you with one final question, speaking of like the next Olympics and world championships. So besides yourself, uh, kind of who do you think the future of Team USA women's hockey is as a goaltender? Oh, man. I mean, it's this year was kind of crazy. I mean, we had our four nations was canceled and we had, you know, just a couple games against Canada. So we ended up playing seven games against Canada this year. And um, they were definitely trying to rotate, you know, goalies to try and, you know, get a, a feel for what we have in the pool. And um, a couple of the young ones, besides Maddie, I mean, it's it's funny because Maddie Rooney, she's young, right? Like in my yeah. eyes, she's young, but she's got the experience of a veteran. So I feel like she's overlooked at times. And in regards to, you know, her age, I think she's only 22 years old, maybe turning 23. And so she's a young one. And then there's, you know, Emma Pluzny, who was part of our team last year, and Aaron Frankel just made our world championship team for the yeah, first time. Yeah, she had time. an incredible year she, in college. Yeah, she did amazing. I mean, she she helped her team do so well this year. I think they were, they were being caught champions this year, and, you know, for her to, to step up the way she did, it was fun getting to know her this past year. Um, we were first teammates in August at an August camp this year, and, you know, she was just such an energetic person and, you know, worked her butt off and it was just fun to see her be so successful this year. Well, thank you so much. I think that just about wraps up all the points that we had uh, want or wanted to talk over. Of course. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Alex, thank you so much. This was great. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. All right. We'll see you. All right. Bye guys. Thank you so much again to Alex Rigsby Cavallini for coming on to the Outer Roll podcast. Had an absolute blast with that interview. And thank you again for tuning in to another episode of the Monkey Sports Podcast and the Outer Roll. We appreciate, as always, your support of our content and everything as we're bringing you back to a normal content schedule. We'll be back again for another episode of the Outer Roll again in one month's time. If you stay subscribed to the Monkey Sports Podcast, we'll be back next week for an episode of Monkey Ball brought to you by Baseball Monkey. One more quick reminder, promo code PODCAST10, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, 10, the number 1010, for 10% off your entire order at GoalieMonkey.com. And thank you so much. We'll see you next month for another episode of The Outer Roll.